Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Land Use Committee virtual meeting, Wednesday, July 8th, 2020, 7 p.m. It is now 7.06 p.m. We are to start. Lana, did you want to call roll? Yes, I'll be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Lisa Karajian? Here. Jesse Porter? Here. Lana Shackleford? I'm here. Andrew Sussman. Here. Richard Niederberg. Here. Dean Cutler. Here. That's all it. right. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on to committee meeting minutes. Uh, I'm still transcribing those. Uh, and like Randy said a little while ago, we do have a recording of it and a transcription of it as well. Um, where do we find those, Randy? Are they archived somewhere? Which one? So tonight's meeting, that when it's recorded, will be uh, so a little later this evening or first thing in the morning. Uh, I will post this to Facebook. It will be on the SCC website. It will be posted presumably later in the day. It goes to Web Corner to post. Um, what about um, past meetings? Are they past, it depends how past me you mean uh, if they were recorded on zoom uh, i have the only recordings that i've seen on zoom uh i'm slowly putting them up brian had downloaded them so that's right. uh, i'm not sure they're not in the zoom because zoom only will keep it in their cloud for when so when a video is recorded via zoom you have two ways of recording it either zoom will record a, a meeting directly to their cloud and from there you can download it or send out links or you can record it and it'll download directly to your computer uh -huh. uh, and then okay. he can take it and upload so i think in the past he downloaded he recorded it directly <laughs> and then uploaded to web to our youtube channel all right cool great thank you um so well, update by me i want to uh introduce a new committee member to land use. Uh, Adele Slaughter is here with us. Hi, Adele. Um, Hi, Lana. Hi. Um, Adele is very passionate about uh, land use, housing in our community. Um, aside from that, she is a brilliant artist, beautiful artwork, uh, a poet, and a champion in doubles tennis. I mean, <laughs> A brilliant lady all around. So welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you. We we uh, we appreciate your interest and uh, you to the committee. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, let's move to public comments. Do we have any public comments? on non-agenda items within the committee. Randy, are you keeping track of that? I don't see any raised hands. None? Okay. Um, so moving on to, since we don't have any public comments? There are no responses. Moving on to item number six, presentation, discussion, and possible motion to change of use from retail to new restaurant. Um, case number DIR-2020-1859. SPP, um, comma, ENV, dash two zero two zero dash one eight six zero um located at one two six one six ventura boulevard in studio city um the architect who will be presenting is not egg so welcome thank you please go ahead and start your presentation so um, existing site on 12616 Ventura um, currently was a retail uh, store um, um, after they uh, left the, site. Uh, the new tenant, uh, a sushi restaurant. Um, I did plans for it. It was for a change of use and health department plans. 
Um, so plans went to uh, specific plan, um, planning department, and then of course you guys are on the, the clearance list. Um, currently, the space has uh, a parking uh, parking lot. Uh, we are short, but we are doing a cash and do where um, the tenant will pay hundred dollars a month towards a parking stall. So we are short. Um, six stalls, so um, each stall is hundred bucks. So uh, each month they will be paying that. Um, other than that, um, we are in the process of plan check, and um, it's been a while. It's um, took took a long time, but we're all almost there. And um, I think this is the final hurdle as far as the uh, planning department. Okay, why don't I go ahead and. Uh move this motion onto the table so we can discuss it. So the Land Use Committee of the Studio City Neighborhood Council uh, recommends that the Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council take the following action. Who wants to bring this to the table? Uh, just real quickly, there was yeah. a, a request that we tell what which store it was just for... Yeah, uh, that's why we're... That's why bringing the motion to the table so we can start discussing it. Okay, I'll second. Is that what you're looking for? Okay, yes. Um, so I brought the motion, uh, Lana seconded. Let's go ahead and move into a discussion. Um, so noted, there are seven uh, existing parking spaces, mm -hmm. right? Right. And you need 13 parking spaces, so there will be six cash in lieu. Yeah. And what are the hours of operation? This restaurant was the retail space fit for life, was it? Uh, uh, next to the Obey Italian Pizzeria um, in the shopping center at one, two, 616 Ventura Boulevard, right across the street from Bed Bath & Beyond. Mm -hmm. I think so, our, um, they're going back and forth. I think they're thinking more on the evening side, maybe dinners um, from four to nine or four to 10. Okay, so we should know that uh, and confirm the hours of operation. So not open for lunch, but open for dinner from four to 10, you said? I believe so, yeah. I can check on that with them. Yeah, because that's not in your application and it needs to be. No, it's and not. is there going to be alcohol served? Yeah, there will be alcohol. Okay, so I don't have that in your application as well. So that needs to be clearly defined. Um, and what kind of alcohol is it? Is it a full liquor license that you guys applied for or is it just beer and wine, sake? Yeah, I didn't do it, but um, I think it's just beer and wine. Okay. Are you, uh, can I ask, uh, Lisa, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is that, uh, as it relates to the liquor license, are you, for beer and wine, so are you, did this potential business, are they, are they planning, thinking that they're going to open a business regardless of whether they get the liquor license? Is it contingent on getting the liquor license? It's not contingent, no. Um, another um, company did that. Um, I don't know if it's approved or not, but it's not contingent to that. No. We're going full, you know, speed with the TI change of use plans. So there will be no liquor served until. Yeah, until once it gets approved, then. And they the tenant applied for a new one, or they bought there was an old never a liquor license there because the space right. is failed. Right, it'll be a brand new liquor license. And so, they, did they apply for it? What's the status on it? Um, they have applied for it. I don't have the status on it. So you don't have a status on it. Um, okay. Do they have any other restaurants? Does this owner have another restaurant anywhere? Um, two partners. They they do have do have some experience in restaurants. Currently, they don't have any restaurants, so this will be the first restaurant you know with them two joining together and opening a new one. 
Okay. They have had restaurant um, you know, experience in the past. Okay. Um, is, that a, uh, is that a full liquor license that they're applying for or beer and wine only? I believe it's just beer and wine, but I can, I can double check on that too. I think does the sake fall under beer and wine? That's yeah, it falls yes. under the beer and wine license. Any other questions from any committee members? No. Where's Richard Niederberg? He's there. What kind of restaurant? I didn't hear exactly what kind. Do we know? Sushi. Kind of Sushi. Sushi. Yeah. Sushi, omakase style. It's going to yeah. be a counter. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe the interior, please, Nadeg, since you're the architect? Uh, yeah. So um, the entrance will be on the parking lot from the side. So there'll be um, double doors going into the space. And then we'll have, we'll have a bar. Uh, sorry. So the entrance is kind of on a 45 degree angle. So after the doors will go, you'll go in and the bar will be in front of you with seating. Um, and then we'll have a, a couple of more seatings towards uh, Ventura on that, on that wall. So it's mainly the bar where, you know, it's long and we have about um, one, two, three, four, about nine, uh, nine or 10 stools. So counter seating, what about table seating? How many tables? We have one, two, three tables. Mm -hmm. So um, eight, 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 eight seats per table, and then the rest is counter. But I think with COVID, there might be some, you know, distance, maybe six feet apart or something. Okay. Between parties. So um, this application is uh, in regard to deficient parking and change of use. So this application is not for the alcohol, um, though I did want to include that in. Um, I'm sure that application will come before us as well mm -hmm. uh, once that is filed. So at this moment in time, with the interior improvements and exterior, is there going to be a new sign going up? Yeah, we'll have new signage. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a picture of that? Do you have a drawing of it? Do you know what it's going to look like? No, another company is doing that. Okay. So this is becoming rather difficult when you're the only person who's presenting and there's no 100% preparation for this. Uh, yeah, well, I'm in charge with the change of use and the tenant improvement. So mm -hmm. my plans are based on that. And that's okay. here presenting change of use and TI. Right, okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions? No. Okay. No one. Uh, yes, um, there's a hand up actually great. from Barry. Excellent. What's your question, Barry? Uh, hi. Hi. So I was just curious, did you did he mention there was any outdoor seating? No, we're not gonna have any outdoor seating with this. And um when you do apply for the um, alcohol license, whatever it ends up being, as Lisa said, it would come back to this committee. <clears throat> and I think at that time, um, you should get the land use committee list for establishments selling alcohol and go through that list and see what you want to apply to this establishment. It has served this committee and this neighborhood council well, and I, I would hope you would do that again. That's all. Yeah, you know what I'll do, Barry, is I'll send him uh, that list via email so that they have it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, if there are any more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, 
And well, I guess I had one last question. Did, sorry. Did you have a, was there a tentative timeline even of when you were, you know, in your ideal world when this business was going to open? Um, as soon as they finish construction, they can open. Um, it's just because with COVID restrictions, which aren't maybe things will be um, separated, there will be significant restrictions. Right. The bar currently, at least, you know, the, the bar in the space won't even be allowed to be open. Um, right. um, I think we will be in construction at least four or five months. So if we get permits, I mean. They haven't even broken ground. No. I drove by there, I got out, I looked through the door, the windows. Uh, Everything is still intact as it used to be the fitness eatery. Yeah, we can't start construction with that. Right. Right. Okay. Cross your fingers that we have a vaccine in four or five months. Crossing those fingers. Um, okay. The board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council um, uh, supports the change of use from retail to restaurant at 12616 Ventura Boulevard in Studio City, DIR-2020-1859. SPP, uh, a 1300 square foot um, area, seven existing parking spaces with six additional parking spaces as cash in lieu per the Ventura Cahuenga uh, Boulevard corridor specific plan. Um, all in support, uh, say aye. Raise your aye. hand. Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Dean, uh, I'm sorry. Dean, I do Dean have to. Dean is, hi, hi, it's Dean. I Dean. do need to ask you to recuse yourself because yeah, you I am. I'm going to recuse myself because I um, represent the landlord here, right. who's involved in the transaction. So I've just been listening, and I'm recusing my vote mm -hmm. right. entirely. Yeah. Um. Okay. So one, two, three. Four, five. Yes, one recused. Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Nadeg. Uh, I'll be in touch with an email. Thank you. Um, Lisa? Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's appropriate or not appropriate. Um, if I want you want me to answer any of the questions that Narg wasn't uh, able to, no, uh, maybe just no. about signage. I mean, they're okay, going to signage. Yes, go ahead. They're they're just going to have channel letters on the front of the building. You know, everything's going to be per. I'm certain, obviously, Ventura Boulevard specific plan signage. Yeah. There is a there is an existing pole sign on that property where there'll just yeah. be a change out of plast the plastic insert. Okay. Oh. It's just the plastic insert. In the pole sign, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hope they do something really nice there. I think that's the intention. Keeping fingers crossed yet again. Okay. Thank you, Dean. Moving on to number seven, uh, discussion and possible motion. Um, standing water, public health issue affecting residents for Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control at 4538 Morse Avenue. Um, Deb Campbell and Paul Dempsey are residents and homeowners. Uh, now, before we start there, I do want to uh, make a comment on this. So, um, we're not gonna be taking a motion um, on number seven. I do want Deb and Paul to uh, make a presentation so that it can be up for discussion. Um, this is also uh, an issue for another committee or maybe even a couple of committees uh, with the Neighborhood Council. 
So it can start here. I'm gonna bounce it over to um, the appropriate committees as well. It should just go around. We also have Diana Gutierrez from um, Vector Control to speak. Um, so I'm gonna kind of tie this all in together. So why don't we start with, Deb, are you here? Okay, yeah. do you wanna unmute yourself? What happened? She went out. We still okay. can. Yeah. Can you hear there me now? Go. Yes, Deb Campbell. Oh, correct? but now you're muted. No? Is there any way that we can unmute her? Yes. Hang on. Just unmute. Randy, is there a way to unmute her? Uh, they just said that I, they asked me to be unmuted, and I said yes. Oh, okay. So there can you, you hear are. me now? Yes. Okay. So go Hi. ahead and introduce yourself and speak on your item. Would you live at the address 4538? It's 4548. Um, four, I've four, lived four, four. Um, Did you by any chance get the email? Uh, it did. Fabulous. Um, so I, I sent the document over earlier. I've been at this address since 1995. Um, within the first couple of years of living here, the route in a tree right next door that uh, lines our driveway uh, started bulging. So we started a campaign trying to remove that route uh, 25 years ago. Um, about 23 years ago, it started becoming a water flooding problem and then has only grown since then. Probably for about 17 years, it's required that I use a commercial brush to sweep it out um, two times to six times a week. Um, the, the damage is now profound in the base of our driveway as per the photos and the information in that document, as well as um, extended gutter through the whole front of our house. Um, we've had mosquito issues for years now, but now that West Nile is here, it's, it's even more of a problem. Um, Wesley Collins was here yesterday at the house, and even though he came only a couple hours after I had just swept all the water away, and um, it was a very hot day, he still found a mosquito float, and one float equals 200 mosquitoes. So even though the vector had even poisoned it like one or two days prior to that, it, this area is so um, destroyed. There is so much uh, bacteria and almost algae that lives in the base of this that it, all it needs is a little water coming from some sprinklers and uh, the bugs are attracted immediately. Meanwhile, children see the flood and they come over and wanna jump in the bottom of the driveway. We have a hawk that lives next door who will sit in it. Um, other birds go over. It's, it's just, so it's a public health issue. One, because of the mosquitoes is probably our biggest concern. And the stench is profound, which means that there's definitely anaerobic activity that is in there that just gets triggered up as soon as the water hits. Um, so that is, uh, we've been, we've basically gone from the ground up um, all the way, uh, all the way from uh, street services, city council, um, the the city advisors. They sent it out to Vector, who ended up sending it to state advisors. And I finally just started writing, um, putting mayors <laughs> um, on my emails. But it started with phone calls, faxes, uh, snail mail, email, three one ones, nothing. So water is collecting there and there's been erosion of the street yes. or the driveway yes. over the years of everything all of it so the where the tree root has gone it's now lifted up the street and there's now crack through the center of the street onto the uh onto the other side the mound has cracked open the curb cracked open the street and right. now um, because of the hill, no water can go past over the drain. So any other water coming from the neighborhood just meets up at that and then flows backward in, in, our, uh, in the house next door, our driveway, and in front of our house. So the erosion, is, the erosion has just gotten so horrible because they continue to put asphalt 
over that area um, right. when they keep redoing the streets and they do it on top of water. So it never even dries. It just goes deeper and deeper. So uh, we've so got areas that are been four removed? inches. Has the what? Tree, has the tree no. been removed? No, so they the never removed. removed the tree. They didn't remove the root. And we started talking about it when the root was, it wasn't a big problem, but they had told us we weren't allowed to do it ourselves. Um, and then never sent someone out. Right. Now it's a big problem. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, anybody with questions? Lana, you're on mute. Andrew, mute. Do you all and want I, to I, mute I, the, in the document, I think, gives a much broader uh, understanding. I just didn't know if you all had it, and I didn't want to uh, repeat. Um, no, it's okay. There. Well, um, we have a similar mosquito problem on Oakdale Road, about the 3300 block. Okay. And there are spots here and there, because I go out and I walk around. I'm walking <laughs> around um, the area, and it is of concern, the standing water in right. in different places. So... Well, and if we go out of town, so we depend, I mean, the whole area right now, frankly, depends on me and my commercial broom um, because I have to, I go out and move it. It's part of my regular routine is moving it. So if when we go out of town and, and come back, even just going away for a couple of days, it's, it's putrid and it's living um, because it's, it, it doesn't get disrupted. So, I mean, that's, part of the only the only reason frankly it's not a, a bigger problem um is because it i i attend to it but it's kind of getting old <laughs> been doing it a long yeah, time you know this is so unfortunate that this is happening um to you as it happens all around sure uh, the valley right so this happened to uh my mom in front of her house uh, when she moved in over 45 years ago, the trees had just been planted. So they were, I don't know, maybe four feet at the time. It's now over 60 feet right. in the air. And it's done exactly to the sidewalk as your tree has done right. to you. And she actually went through not as many years as you. You're, you've invested many, many years. Um, but she just took it upon herself and had um, the sidewalk repaired herself. Well, if it were the sidewalk, our sidewalk is fine. I'm, yeah. If it were the sidewalk, it wouldn't be a problem. It's, right. it's the street. Um, the street itself has, has raised up so high, and they continue to try to just put asphalt over the top. Uh, when the DWP was here and they were doing the pipes about two years ago, uh, mm -hmm. They had all the equipment that was needed. But right now, what has to happen is they need to cut a hole in the street. They need to take that out, take the root out, and then actually re, re, uh, bring the street level down. Repave um, it? Yeah, it? Yeah, with cement. It's a, it's a big, I mean, it's, a, it's now a big problem. So I don't, my sidewalk's fine. The neighbor's sidewalk, the driveway, I, right. you know, I, I, whatever. Uh, I'm not thoroughly concerned about that the aesthetic of that the right. problem is that it's 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 a health hazard um but yeah i'm not i'm not the the least bit worried about the aesthetic of it frankly i just but it is a health hazard um and again we don't have a schedule when vector comes we don't have street cleaning on our on our street um there is no uh, and so if I go out and I, I've cleaned it, then the inspector comes fine. But otherwise there may be days like, like yesterday where I've just cleaned it. Um, or if, sorry, that if maybe vector came and I didn't see, and then I clean it. So I've removed and pushed down everything that they've just done. I, it's, I think it's just, it's a, there's no organization to the management of it right now. Right. There are many, many pieces of this, uh, a comprehensive attack on it right. is what it, it needs. Right. I, I mean, I, I, it's really a shame, actually. They just couldn't, 
use the DWP at the time, turn it around, cut the hole, and everything was here. It was all, and actually I called. It's in one of the emails. I actually was on the phone with street services saying, everybody's right there, and they've agreed to do it. They said they have time, but it needs to be um, approved from above, and, and they wouldn't do it. So I, I've just, I've, I've made all the calls and I mean, we've been doing this for so long and, and asking all the people that they told us to. Um, and we've been told over and over again, there just isn't money for that. Or I'll, I'll put your thing into this next person. And it right. just, um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring Nancy Kramer in. She has her hand up. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, hi. Um, th thanks. Um, Lisa, I, I don't really have anything to say much except for that everything that Deb said is accurate. I live on the block. Mm -hmm. it, it's a huge hazard for the, for the neighbors and we are blessed to have Deb sweeping the street all week long <laughs> for the rest of our lives. And <laughs> I'm getting older. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's real. It's probably oh. real. I'm on the block. We could uh, all be so lucky to have a great neighbor like Deb, right? Yeah, well, yes, it's exactly. not as much fun at 55 as it was at, you know, at, yeah. at 31. Right, <laughs> I have someone else with their hand up. I think they want to speak to this. Um, 323? Yeah, it's me. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, Deb. This, uh, is, this is Barry Johnson. I'm currently the Transportation Committee Chair. And I'm so sorry to hear you've had the runaround on this for 15 years. It's ridiculous. And 20, I've actually, 25. <laughs> oh, okay, 25. <laughs> but, well, in the last 15 years, I've actually gotten three of these locations fixed. Wow. But <clears throat> I'm telling you, it wasn't easy. And, and in the city of LA, we actually, it's often been said that we live in a city of 15 kingdoms and the kings are the council members. And really nothing happens in each of the kingdoms unless that king decides it's going to happen. And your situation at this point after all these years seems to be case in point to be brought forward to our um, council member. So um, I would like to do that for you. That would be wonderful. I, I was in contact with Paul Krikorian's office a few times, but it never went, nothing ever happened. So that would the be amazing. Is, so his what I'm staff gonna... often shields him from work that needs to be done because he may, they may know he's going through a critical budget time or whatever, but it's like, when I when I'm on my job and I run into them in a public place, I, I get a lot of things done just saying, "Yeah, did you know about this?" And half the time, his staff has been written about it, but he doesn't know, and I'm got the it. first one telling him. Oh, so, right, that'd um, be amazing! Do, all right, Barry. So what I'm going to do, um, Deb, is I'm going to go ahead and send you over to Barry and his okay. transportation committee and Great. we'll go ahead and do all that he said he was going to do and make sure that you get taken care of. Okay. That'd be amazing. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. for and Deb, can I get your email address? If I tell you mine, can you just send oh, me your email? Oh, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Well, Barry, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Okay, take care. You too. See if we can get a copy of vector control too. Because it's yes. a problem. Um, okay. Is I'm Diana counting. Gutierrez here? Let me see if she has her hand up. Hello. Oh. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are how's everyone doing? Good. Good. Thank you for Give oh, me one second, awesome. Diana. Mm -hmm. um, um, we are now moving to the Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control District. Um, we have Diana Gutierrez joining us from Vector Control. There she is, and she's going to be doing a presentation. So, yes. well, thank you. Thank Go you. And then again, Debbie, I'm happy that you know we were able to finally you know get this solved. 
Oh, thank you. I, I really, I'm very excited that yes. Barry is going to pick up on this. Okay, uh, let me get my thing going. May I share my screen? I think I can, right? Okay, let's see. Do, do, um, oh, uh, host disabled particip participant screen sharing. Would you be able to allow me to share my screen, please? Is that a Randy? Yeah, uh, I, yeah I think yeah. either one of us. Uh, give me one second and we'll do that. Thank you, and, then, and I got my timer no on. So 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, so, um, Diana, uh, introduce yourself as you're the liaison for Studio City. Yes, so I'm the community liaison for San Fernando Valley, so Studio City. So if you need any information, any materials, any presentations similar to this one with any other organizations, uh, feel free to contact me and I will be able to schedule that in person or in Zoom as well. Okay, so, Diana, you should be good to go. Yes, awesome. All righty, so. Thank you, Randy, that's so great. This is the first time I'm seeing this. Oh, okay, yeah. so everyone seeing it? Perfect. Okay, so again, thank you for inviting me. My name is Diana Gutierrez. I am the community liaison for Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control District, and I'm here to present to you about mosquitoes in Los Angeles. So just a little history about us. We are Greater Los Angeles County Vector Control District. We are an independent special district similar to a water district, but we focus on mosquitoes. We're 1950 under the authority of California State Health and Safety Code, and we currently serve 35 cities within Alley County and sections of unincorporated Alley County. And we also serve nearly 6 million residents in a span of 1,300 square miles. So we do have a very large uh, area to serve. So what do we do at Alley uh, at our district? So we are divided into three departments, disease surveillance, mosquito management, and uh, community outreach. Um, under disease surveillance, our vector ecologists monitor mosquito abundances, which means we do set up traps throughout the district, and every week we do collect those traps, and we send around a, a sample size of mosquitoes to UC Davis, and they do test um, those mosquitoes if they do have West Nile virus or any other diseases. And that does give us a little indication of um, that there are communities that have West Nile virus samples that, um, uh, positive West Nile virus samples. Um, under mosquito management, our um, technicians, they maintain storm drains, pools, public drains, yard inspections, they do service requests, source reduction, and elimination. Um, and our communications department, we do community presentation, community events, presentations, similar to this one, and um, school programs, press releases, um, anything digital, social media, really. So the first thing that we need to focus on is mosquitoes need stagnant water to grow. Um, after a female mosquito bites us, she looks for standing water so she lays her eggs. And as it was mentioned, she can lay up to 100 to 350 eggs. Um, and as we know, mosquitoes do go through a life cycle of four stages. So it's egg, larva, pupa, and adult. So if you think about it, if you divide that by uh, 25, um, one fourth, 75% of their life cycle is actually spent in water. And they can actually complete their cycle within five to seven days, but in the summertime when it is hotter, they can actually complete their life cycle uh, within three to five days. So that makes it more critical to uh, remove standing water from your property. So um, around the world, there are 3,000 types of uh, species of mosquitoes, but in our presentation, we'll be we will be focusing on two. So on top, you see the Culex mosquito. This is the brown native, native mosquito that we are, we are comfortable with, or native. It, it, it's been here forever. Um, they primarily bite uh, birds and people and other, ma other animals, but they mainly focus on birds. Their habitat is outdoors. They prefer larger, uh, larger containers of water, pools, ponds, and gutters of standing water. And they're usually active uh, during dusk and dawn. And the diseases that they can transmit are West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis, and Western equine encephalitis. And on the bottom, we see the 80s mosquito. This is the black and white um, invasive ankle biter. 
we, is also known as the ankle biter. Um, they do bite, they primarily bite people um, and then occasionally mammals. Uh, they do like to go indoors and outdoors. They prefer small containers of standing water. And as I mentioned, they are aggressive uh, ankle biters and they bite, th uh, they, bite, they bite all day, comparison to our QX mosquito, which only bites during the dusk and dawn. And the diseases that they can transmit are Zika, Dengue, Yellow Fever, Chikungunya, and to our furry friends, canine heartworm. But I want to emphasize that these uh, diseases are, uh, there has not been any local transmission of these local, of these diseases. Okay. Okay, so we'll talk about the first, uh, the Southern House Mosquito. Um, as I mentioned, West Nile virus um, is here. So it is an, an endemic. So it means that it is in LA County year round. Um, and as I mentioned, it is year round. Um, so um, it is here every, every year. You, as you see this, um, this, this graph, um, the, these numbers, this is actually common. Um, we usually do have our first West Nile virus um, detection early June. So, you know, usually it is on schedule. Um, comparing it from Studio City from last year, your numbers were, uh, you actually only had one West Nile virus um, positive ma uh, mosquito sample in November, eh, September. So it is, a, um, compared to this year from last year, it is a little early, but um, we've been seeing that um, comparing from a five-year average, there are more mosquitoes active um, abundance this year compared to previous years. So some of the symptoms for West Nile virus, if you are bit by a mosquito that has West Nile virus, um, 70 to 80 percent do not have any symptoms. One in five do develop a flu-like symptoms like tiredness, headache, fever, um, similar to what we are currently facing, the COVID-19. Um, and in one in 150 are severely ill. So Symptoms could be coma, tremors, or uh, seizures. And obviously the most at risk are those uh, over 50 and with weakened immune systems. And there's currently no vaccine or treatment for West Nile virus for humans. So now again, with the 80s mosquito, they were actually introduced to our district in 2011. Um, they were, uh, their first location was South El Monte. Um, and from there, they have been spreading throughout our district. And the reason why is because, as I mentioned before, they do like small containers, man-made containers. And where would they be able to find those? Obviously at our homes. So it is really important to identify these potential breeding sources. We all have um, plant saucers, water uh, plants in our homes. Uh, we have um, dogs, cats, we have their bowls. It is really important to always change that water. And um, it's important to identify what are some potential breeding sources. And as you can see in the bottom, anything, can, anything, any container that can hold water can become a breeding source. Mm. I don't know, it's not changing. And here are some other sources, um, you know, a um, pool, um, a tarp, even a basketball court, um, the stand can be a, a, a potential breeding source. These mosquitoes only need a bottle cap of water so they can lay their eggs. Mm. And as, as I mentioned before, the Culex mosquito, our native mosquito, um, they do like outdoor sources. And the 80s mosquito, they actually like going indoors and outdoors. So these are some potential breeding sources that you can potentially find indoors. Um, we've talked to residents before saying, I'm getting bit indoors, I don't know why. And we asked, do you have uh, indoor plants? Do you have water plants? And they say, oh yes, I do. So they'll bring them up to the door and we, can, we will see that there's, um, breeding larva, uh, mosquito larva, mosquito eggs, all around that, all around that source. So it, it, we have found uh, mosquito breeding uh, sources indoors as well. So mosquito control is a shared responsibility. Um, so it's really important, you know, our district area, as you know, is really large and we wish we can um, 
go to every house. However, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that. So what we need is for your help um, to just, you know, go, to your, go through your yard, um, go through your, um, your home to see if there's any potential for resources. Talk to your neighbors um, about mosquitoes. If, hey, I'm getting bit, are, are, are you getting bit at, at your property? Because mosquitoes do not fly far. So if, um, if you do have a breeding source, you know, potentially they might go to your neighbors too. So it is important just to use these tips. So tip and toss any standing water indoors and outdoors. Uh, remove, scrub, and flip over and cover any containers that can hold water. Uh, drill the holes of, drill all the bottoms of uh, open containers so recyclables. We see a ton of people have sometimes accumulation of uh, water or whatever was it, liquids there, and mosquito, mosquitoes can actually breed in those as well. Um, and if you cannot remove the water because you have a decorated pond or um, the, the water source is just too large, use mosquito dunks. Um, they are biological and, and natural occurring bacteria found in soil. It is a larvicide that actually kills the larva before they can become adults. And it doesn't harm um, bird, it doesn't harm uh, people, birds, other animals, aquatic life, or any, any um, uh, animal that drinks that water. So how to prevent mosquito bites? Obviously, wear long sleeve shirts, pants while mosquitoes are present, preferably loose, um, because if you are wearing yoga pants, they can bite through yoga pants as well if you don't use repellent. Um, and also maintain screens on your windows and doors. Use EPA registered uh, insect repellent containing DEET, IR 3535 picaridin, or oil and eucalyptus. And because obviously we're all all enjoying the sun warmth, sunscreen, and then it's uh, insect repellent. And then also avoid um, any of those candles, the buds, bug zapters, the stickers, the wristbands. Those usually, uh, how we try to explain it is, uh, the band is basically protecting the band by itself. So if you want to protect yourself, obviously you would have to put a ton of bands throughout your body so you're actually protected. And then I also included on the bottom, um, these are, um, some pills that you can actually um, buy for your furry friends. However, we do recommend that um, if you want to buy something for your furry friends to ask your, rec uh, to ask your veterinarian, what do they recommend um, so they do not get any mosquito pets as well, uh, and also home. And so people always ask, when is mosquito season? Well, California, beautiful California, mosquito season is always year round, um, but uh, mosquito, mosquito activity does increase in mid-June into um, early June to mid-October. So that's why it's very, very important to always wear insect repellent early on to the year. And as we are in July, you know, um, that's, when our, that's when we technically have our peak season. So it's definitely more important to emphasize um, removing the sand standing water, talking to your neighbors, and then also wearing that insect repellent. And so I did go through that very quickly. Um, but just some, some stuff to highlight, you know, um, to take away. Mosquitoes need standing water to lay eggs, to lay their eggs and go through their Mosquitoes can transmit West Nile virus, Zika, and dengue. Tip and toss any containers that can hold water. Wear insect repellent and keep the, win keep the screens on your windows and doors. And also mosquito control is a shared responsibility. And we, we, both, we hope that you can share all this information and knowledge to your friends and family. And because we are going to a pan we are going through a pandemic, we just want to emphasize that the COVID nineteen cannot be transmitted through mosquito bites. Um, so um, here are all of our face our social media um, platforms. Um, please visit our website for any information. Um, it's a great resource uh, to use, and um, if you have any questions, we're here for you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, let me stop sharing. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. That was really great. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Lana. Unmute yourself. Thank you. How about properties in the area that have those tiny drains, but they're in closed places? For example, apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. um, ha is it just up to residents to contact <laughs> Vector? Um, I believe, yes, uh, I, I know we, I know I've gone through, um, um, 
usually when I went to, when I've gone to the field with some, some inspectors, we actually talk to the property manager um, and then we help identify um, any of those sources. Uh, and ways that they can mitigate standing water, right, on the drains. Is there a quick tip that you might have to share uh, yeah. about uh, drains, uh, you know? Definitely what we recommend is um, always changing the chicken wire. I think it's called chicken wire. Changing the wire the, on top the of the top. Drain. So, the, mm -hmm the lid like was in the photograph right that little yep. small grate mm -hmm. okay so what we recommend is always um change we always have we what we always well we usually have a sample but we have the to the top of the drain and then we have a wire on the bottom is the chicken wire um that um okay. decreases um you know um uh what is it leaves being collected in, in inside the drain and always um you know just keeping an eye on that and obviously if, if there is collection of water um using BTI as well. Okay, and BTI stands for? Um, it's a, it's a called, I don't know. Okay. Is it a spray or? No, 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 it's like, it's called, we call it mosquito donuts. So they they look like a okay. little donut. Okay. Um, and you can actually buy them um, at, um, at uh, Lowe's, um, uh, any of those stores, uh, uh, okay. Home Depot. And then usually, um, I think they last uh, up to 30 days. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you much. Sure. Um, Barry has a question. Barry? Uh, yeah, I, w I was just curious regarding stagnant water in a street gutter like Deb was reporting to us. Your um, COVID updated website says, and I quote, Field staff will continue to monitor mission critical programs in public spaces, such as flood control channels, rivers, street gutters, underground storm drains, etc. What does this actually mean that you do for a street gutter that has stagnant water? Yep. So we actually drive, um, our inspectors do have a Jeep and they actually do um, spraying on, on, on um, the street gutters. The spray is, uh, um, um, the spray um, is, is not toxic. Um, you know, I'm not really um, informed about, um, I do know that it's not toxic to, you know, life forms, or, um, you know, of course people as well. Um, so, um, but if you do want to know more information about our street gutters, um, I can definitely um, direct you to our um, operations supervisor as, um, who was it? Uh, as I were mentioning, uh, Wesley. Um, he is a very uh, knowledgeable in uh, our, um, on our um, public uh, spaces. But you just sp spray for the problem. The scope of your work doesn't go beyond that. You could be spraying for the next 50 years if people keep calling it in, mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, we, we all public places we, we maintain. Great, thank you so much, Diana. Does anyone else have a question? I just had a quick question. Sure. Uh, well, I guess a two-parter. One was, I just thought my neighbor has a bug zapper and you mentioned that bug zappers are, are not recommended. So I wanted to know about that. And then the second was, um, a lot of new construction homes, uh, like my like mine, similarly they, they install French drains. So uh, French drains tend there tends to be standing water in this. Is this something vector control can come or I should tell a pest control to put dunks or is there like a a smaller pellet version of those to drop into those types of drains? Because I imagine they don't get completely empty. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see. Okay, for so for your first pro, for your first question, what was your first question? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, bug, about, about bug zappers. Yes. So I've I've heard um, in our in, in vector control that they actually attract mosquitoes. So if you do want to use them, we do recommend them to be used all the way to the um uh, like um to the, at the at the end of the um corner of your home where you're not going to be obviously sitting. Um. So that's what that's what we usually recommend. And then for your second question, French, French drains, what are those? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. So they're basically drains that are putting in gardens to drain excess water and take it 
uh, out to the street. Mm -hmm. mm. I've seen them and I, I, ha I have seen them um, in some of our properties. Um, I, I, I actually don't know, but um, I can actually ask Wesley um, that question, if I can have your email or contact, and he would be definitely the more knowledgeable on that. Great. Yes, no, definitely. <laughs> Diana, I'll go ahead and send you Randy. Yes, please. No, no, no yes. I'm not going to answer something that I don't know. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Of course. No, of course. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, Lisa, you have a calling user one who has a hand raised. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um... I thought so. Um, <laughs> that's why I was so skeptical. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't. Um, all right. No thanks, Anna. <laughs> okay, really well, appreciate it. Of course, thank you so much for um, having me. And um, yes, please um, give me, um, your, Randy, your contact inf information and I will definitely ask um, our operations supervisor for that. I'll one. email it to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Everyone have a good evening. You bye too. Bye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number B under number eight. Um, the Tenant Protection Act. Uh, 2020 part one and two. Lana, did you, you give us a little presentation on parts one and two? You're muted. You're muted. Go ahead. No? I'll unmute you. Hang on. There. You need to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. It will not be as uh, slick as Diana's presentation. Mine will just be a quick overview of the Tenant Protection Act, uh, which the link in the agenda is to a, a lovely uh, article um, that covers in detail the two components of this Tenant Protection Act, which was passed in October of 2019 and went into effect this January 1, 2020, and will remain in effect for 10 years until January 1, 2030, when it will be repealed. Uh, the Tenant Protection Act is known as TPA, and it made significant changes pertaining to landlords and tenants. Uh, and these changes greatly impact how landlords um, are going to be, uh, you know, establishing evictions um, and rate increases going forward. Uh, part one of this article covers in detail some of the issues regarding just cause evictions. Mm -hmm. um, this act prohibits landlords from evicting tenants without documented lease violations after a renter has lived in an apartment for a year. The ac applicability of the TPA is comprehensive, covering most multiple unit residential real estate housing and the single family residential units owned by a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust, a corporation or a LLC with a corporate member. However, there are numerous exemptions for multifamily units and um, conditions for the single family uh, renters to be excluded uh, and to okay. review the list of the properties that are exempt from the TPA, uh, refer to that article. They are, they are numerous. Um, and the, some of that is a uh, very specific legal processes mm. that must be followed. Uh, no longer will it be just um, you know, a murky area. It's going to be very, very specific and it's written out. 
um, part two of this article covered information about rent caps. Um, a rent cap would not apply to apartments built within the last 15 years or single family home rentals unless they're owned by corporations or other um, multi, you know, functional investors. Um, the limits on rent increases will not change for renters currently in rent controlled apartments. However, the new rules extend protections for renters living in newer complexes in cities with rent control. LA typically has a range of three to 4% a year uh, for uh, buildings built before October 1978. Uh, tenants in buildings constructed between that time and 2005 will now be subject to this statewide rent cap. Wow. Act. And there, there's much more detail in those articles, it's it's very well written and, and concise. So I would refer everyone who needed to have more details about that to, to take a look at that article that's linked on this agenda. Excellent. I thought it was a really good informative article as well. That's why I wanted to include it. Yes, and thank you, it was, it was very informative. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, moving on to, um, did you want to speak about the housing assistance and the emergency rental subsidy program on any of it, since you're all into the renters, um, protection program and an advocate for them? So is that in, is that on B? Uh, no, it's Did I miss something? It's okay. It's okay. On C, I just wanted housing to assistant sure. yeah. at the moratoriums? Yes. Oh, well. No, um, that's fine. I just wanted to include the links. Right. So that every um, link that could help someone uh, during this uh, pandemic um, who needs assistance can find it. Uh, just to click away and uh, 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 yes, and, and on the um, the housing department, the HCDILA housing department in yeah. reinvestment and community uh, website, uh -huh. you can find information for renter relief. Uh, also, the moratorium I believe has been extended to this July twenty third. 2020, um, at, well, the, the 31st, I'm sorry, to the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I know right now. Okay, perfect. So um, the links are there for any renter that uh, needs assistance. Um, assembly members, uh, Nazarians invite uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to include the date, but I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow. Um, I don't know if anyone RSVP'd for that, um, but he is having a town hall um, on the road to a vaccine. Um, moving on to the city's environmental review process for NOHO, um, that's begun. So. Um, Anyone has any thoughts, comments, um, concerns, please follow the link and let your voice be heard. Um, we do wanna hear from you in regard to the project. Uh, again, the link to Plan to House LA um, is up. Uh, should you wanna get involved, follow that link. Um, so uh, now we get to I and beyond to the bills um, that are in registration right now. So um, wanted to know, I had assigned individuals to talk about uh, 
as in committee members to talk about each one of these bills. I know Adele, our newest committee member, um, is very versed in these bills as well, so she can speak to them also. So um, who had um, J and K? And if you're up, do you want to unmute yourself, Jesse? That would be great. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So I'll be First brief. First and foremost, how are you feeling? Thank you. Much better. Yeah. I had the surgery a week ago today and yeah. definitely on the mend. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. It's nice to be standing up. Good. Um, so Jay is the housing bill, state bill uh, 1299, um, which uh, basically reads, <clears throat> The Department of Housing and Community Development shall administer a program to provide incentives in the form of grants allocated in accordance with this chapter to local governments that rezone idle sites used for a big box retailer or commercial shopping center to instead allow the development of workforce housing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, it's incentives to repurpose idle big box retail and uh, potentially strip malls as well with housing. Um, this particular bill, from what I've seen, has not um, uh, drummed up a whole lot of uh, controversy or much opposition. It seems to be um, fairly innocuous as far as, uh, as far as these housing bills go, <clears throat> certainly co as compared to others. It seems like, um, you know, potentially a reasonable idea. Uh, it's supported by Livable California. Um, and I believe a few other organizations. So yeah, um, idle big box retailers and, and strip malls repurpose this housing. Mm -hmm. um, so no uh, opposition towards it or not much at least? I didn't find any in my, I didn't, I didn't dig too deep, but I haven't seen anyone uh, pose, nothing jumped out. So commercial space is all over California? It yeah, just it looks all over like California, right? Yeah, big box retailer specifically, 75,000 square feet right. or more. Um, yeah, anywhere within the states, you know, uh, local governments have discretion to make these uh, allowances or not, et cetera. Um, so that's all I've got on that one. If anybody wants to uh, add or amend. Yeah, Adele, did you want to have uh Something to say on 1299? You need to unmute yourself. Why? Hang on, let me see. Oh, there, I got it. You got it? Yeah, okay. it said that you had muted me, so I couldn't. Um, the only thing uh, that else I know about it is that, I have some feedback, um, is that they, this bill goes around CEQA but um, the retail spaces have already gone through a CEQA process, so no one's quite concerned about that because they feel like this is a good use. I mean, what people s seem to feel why no one's um, objecting to it is that um, it t is a good use of space that's not really being used. And yeah, it can also be uh, spaces for low and moderate income housing. So it mm -hmm. transforms existing resources. Do we know if there are any council file numbers attached to any of these bills yet? Because if not, we should. Uh, Adele, would you mind looking into seeing if there are any council files? Yep. Uh, so you can report next month to yep. it, and then uh, we can most likely. Um, start a CIS process and get some letters out with a motion. Okay. Um, okay, Jesse, do you want to move on to the next one? Well, you had uh, Barry's hand up actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Barry. Hi, I was just curious if this means a big box store would be torn down and new housing built or would they build cubicles inside the big box store? Um, and also, I don't believe all big box stores 
have gone through CEQA. It depends how big they are. Like a Best Buy, say, in Sherman Oaks, if it closed, I don't think it went through CEQA, but a Walmart maybe did. Hmm. So I guess we don't know the answer to that. <laughs> no, this is just a preliminary, let's get it on um, our radar, let's start discussing it, and I think as we move forward, we'll start diving deeper into it and have more information as we move along. Is but it possible, perhaps the suggestion would be that if, uh, depending on who's sponsoring the bill in the uh, state legislature, perhaps um, given the world of Zoom, they would be amenable to having themselves or a staffer come and present. If any one of these issues seems of significant interest to this committee, maybe just go directly to the sponsoring um, member of the legislature. Sure. It, it, was written, it was written by Padilla, Padilla. and he um, has a good reputation for writing clear bills that aren't, you know, confusing and pretty straightforward. So we can look, we can go to him. Just an idea. And then Lana had her hand up as well. Hi. Okay, so this process of the rezoning then would be in the hands of the local governmental agencies and thus who would handle this sale? Is that going to be at a, at a local level with city funds? I mean, who's going to take over that property? Is it going to be like Parks and Rec where there'll be some cohesive oversight of things like that? Hmm. I, I don't think so. I think that it will be sold. And in other words, a commercial developer could come in and build housing there. But, but they'd have to buy the, they have to buy it. In other words, it's really trying to make commercial space be um, able to be used for living space. And they're going to look at private the industry, of what we do. Mm -hmm. right? So it'd be through private industry that they are looking. To, yeah, they're, they're just the going to change the bill so that private industry could come in and buy those spaces and put up ah. low to moderate income housing. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jesse. Moving on. Yeah. Moving on. Okay. Okay. So state bill 902. Uh, relates to density. Uh, there's a lot more chatter about this one. Um, Senate Bill 902, which is authored by uh, Senator Scott Wiener out of San Francisco. Um, basically, the language is this. Um, this is sort of, it's sort of considered a, a lighter version of fifty, which we local government an ordinance uh, that limits the legislative body's ability to adopt zoning ordinances to zone any parcel for up to ten units of residential density per parcel at a height specified by the local government in the ordinance. If the par parcel is located in a transit-rich area, jobs-rich area, or an urban infill site. Um, it's, it's been said about this, it, it effectively removes uh, or has the potential to remove single family zoning in almost all jurisdictions in California, um, one way or another, depending on the size of the municipality. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, so essentially um, the local government has, what, what differentiates it from 50 is that it's not a top down um, state uh, mandate, uh, local government needs to pass a resolution to rezone the neighborhood, but they now have the ability to do so, um, for more, to rezone for more density. Um, and the numbers in question are something along these lines, let's see. Uh, duplexes in cities with fewer than 10,000 residences, triplexes in cities with between 10 and 50,000 residences, residents, and fourplexes in cities with more than 50,000, 
um, as well as up to eight and ten plexes in larger cities. Current building heights imposed by cities would stay the same under the bill, along with other local building rules, such as design, design guidelines. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's uh, taller apartment buildings in urban areas near transits and job centers. Um, but the, the opposition is that it's still sort of a, a one size fits all approach, um, encouraging density and uh, potentially, I mean, you know, uh, giving municipalities the ability to eliminate single family or single, single unit zoning altogether. So that's the whole goal, isn't it? Like to uh, eliminate single family residential homes. Do you want to, to give, add to that? Uh, municipalities more tools to do that, yes. Right. Do you have a public comment from uh, Birch? I do have something to add before you go into public comment. Um, this, uh, this bill also end runs CEQA and it also does not provide for any affordable units. It's actually targeting moderate to um, high end units. Um, and it, yeah, and everything else that Jesse said. Go ahead, Barry. Yeah, Scott, Scott Weiner is from densely populated San Francisco. Um, you should all know. And he's been defeated on this three times by organizations that have united across the state, including the Studio City Residents Association. This is a terrible bill. It takes away local control. And it would mean any one of you that I'm looking at it on the screen right now that happens to own a home and has put your heart, soul, and life savings into purchasing could have a four or five story or six story building built next door to you. This absolutely is not the answer to homelessness. And it takes away the rights of single family homeowners, which we have a lot of in the city of Los Angeles. So there's other ways like the previous bill you were discussing about rezoning of idle retail sites, it's not like there isn't land around that can be used, but it shouldn't be a four story building next to a single family home. So I truly believe Mr. Weiner will be defeated again. I do have to say also about Weiner, um, his bills might be appropriate for San Francisco but they're not appropriate for all of California. We're not like San Francisco. We're not as densely populated. If you've ever been there, you can't even get a parking space. So it's a different, you know, he's, it's, you know, he's trying to one size fits all and it just doesn't work. I think he needs to go back to writing bills that are, you know, that work for the whole um, of the state or figure out a different way. I don't know. Or just to his neighborhood. Yeah, state is <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'll um, add to this, however um, anybody feels about density as an imperative, it's problematic that the bill, uh, as Adele mentions, lacks the, uh, uh, any allowances for um, affordable housing. And the fact that it bypasses environmental review as well is, you know, you'd have to ask why. Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Thank you, Jesse. That was awesome. Um, SB1085, you have a public comment on the uh, from England from uh, Wayne Spindler. That's right. It's me, Mitchell Englander, the rat. So you don't want to build housing for the homeless. I am recording this for posterity. Finally, we know the truth. Okay, so um, 1085. You have to unmute yourself, Andrew. Hang on. 
Let me see if I can unmute you. There we go. Getting cut off again. The truth really hurts, doesn't it? You're nothing but a bunch of sociopathic Trump supporters dressed up as little liberal, good little participants in life, aren't you? Now, my goat, unfortunately, he was cut off, so goat, goat puppet is very hurt, so I'll have to speak for both of us. But, yes, I support Mr. Weiner. Let's get rid of all of this bribery and corruption in these goddamn projects and just let them go to the window, pay the fee, and build more fucking shit. you got to build more shit because you got to house everybody and charge those $3,000 rent. So people like Paul Krikorian can get more money for rent. People like Lisa Karjakian can get more for rent. That's what we need. Higher rents, higher projects, larger Florida area ratios, and no corruption and no payoffs. So we put the money directly in the community. That's why when I went to yesterday and I watched Mitchell Englander plead guilty, none of you would show up because you don't have the guts to face the goddamn judge. I faced the judge and I said, thank you, Your Honor. That guilty little rodent should go to jail along with the other 14 council members. Put them all in jail, support Mr. Weiner, and let's build more shit. Regular housing is not going to cut it. Let's all have accessory dwelling units on the top of our houses, on the top of our garages, in the alleys, and no parking restrictions. Let's build more shit. That's what we have to do. Then when we make enough money, the few of us, we can go to a community like Oxnard Shores where they don't let you get away with that. See, you're good Democrats, but you're really Trump Democrats. So go ahead, say it to me. Trump. Your time is expired. Trump 20. Whoa. Sorry. Yes. I know, I will. You have to unmute yourself. It's asking me to ask you to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hi. 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 Okay. Uh, can we talk? SB 1085, density yeah. bonus law. So I'll keep it very, very brief. Thank you. Uh, so 1085 mm -hmm. addresses the multifamily density bonuses and uh, tweaks it here and there and all over the place. And it's very long and wordy and has exceptions and inclusions and on and on. And I can't go through everything. Uh, the for me, it boils down to that they're cleaning it up a little bit and uh, adding to it in terms of one of the key factors is they are allowing when there's a percentage of low cost housing and it's based on the full scope of the project, they're letting those bonuses be factored mm -hmm. in to be included in the additional bonuses, which will give them a few extra units. So let's say you have a building with 100 units and 30% is allowed for low cost housing. So that'd be 130. So now they're saying that they count them as 130 and get a bonus based on that. So that's one of the things. And, and they address all kinds of different things like um, uh, parking and student housing and elderly housing, and it goes on and on and on. So it just, it's an existing bill, you know, that they're fine tuning. Okay. Like, I understand 
uh, God is in the details, or the details are in God or something like that, but it's just hard to address every single thing. There's some things that are good, some things that are not as good, in my opinion. Right. So that's uh, 1085. Uh, 1120 is much simpler. Mm -hmm. uh, that addresses basic uh, lot splits. So it's parcel maps, but it's only on single family lots that are going to be split into two. Mm -hmm. And they're mostly by rights, and they're trying to, uh, the way it is now, they go through public hearings and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're trying to make it ministerial and let the uh, professionals, the planners make those decisions. Now, having gone through this numerous times, especially by right, even though there could be a public hearing, unless there's an incredibly adverse or unique or not by right, because there's so much precedent and there is codes and rules and regulations on how to split a lot and whether you have enough and if you're in the right zoning, that the planner will 99% of the time go along with the by right and the precedent over the years. Now, what has happened is sometimes when you have them, uh, a public hearing, the organizations, and we've been through enough of those, will uh, demand or request certain concessions. Uh, but they can still kind of do that in, in a letter form or whatever. So I don't know. I, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, it's something I would probably be in favor of to simplify and uh, help just basic, it's residential, single family, a lot's big enough, someone can split it. It's a long, long process anyway, and it'll, uh, I think, streamline it and allows them to go by the laws. So that's just my opinion on that. Great. Can I um, add to those? Thank you for looking into that. Um, Adele, did you want to uh, add something to that? Well, <clears throat> on 1085, um, the way I read that particular bill is that they're making uh, changes to the density bonus law by going around zoning laws and not promoting low income and affordable housing. So it incentivizes the construction of moderate income units at the expense of the low and the um, very low income. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it, which means it exacerbates the crisis for lower income house, house, housing even further. And also the benefits to the student housing developments, um, they don't add any increased affordability in that bill. So the bill, I think some of these bills are like, because you, as Andrew said, they're very worded it's very complex and there are bombs in them that are going to go off and they need to address the bombs and there may be good parts to the uh to the bills but there there's there's parts that are dangerous to, that will affect our um you know quality of life and and sb 1120 um i think it actually it ends single family zoning in most of California and allows family homes to be up zoned for, I think, depending on um, density, four to two or eight units, which means, so uh, uh, duplexes of four to two or eight units could be built on single family parcels. Mm -hmm. even, even if local officials and residents have said they don't want them. And it allows for the creation of parcels that are smaller than local governments even allow. So um, I think that it, I think that local governments are concerned that these restrictions will have impact their ability to promote orderly development. So, uh, 
you know, I think you have to look further into both of these bills. I'm not so sure about these bills. And um, so it sounds to me like they favor the developer more it than anything. Like it. it looks yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Also, SB uh, 20 is not the only bill in leg legislature to increase the number of units that can be developed on areas that are traditionally reserved for single family use. As you know, SB 50, which died on the Senate floor, right. did the same thing. So, and this is sort of the follow up. These are the, and SB 902 is again, these are follow ups because they want to um, rezone single family uh, plots. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there, they do increase density. That's the point of these uh, bills for sure. And there is a lot of good things and a, a lot of things like Adele said, the little bombs or little hidden things in there that take a lot of time to uh, decipher and get your head around. And I don't really know, we as a committee, you know, are we going to, you know, it, it really isn't all yes or no. You know, it's a matter of making comments saying, I like this, I don't like that. Right. Then what? And that, that takes a lot of time and even debate from that point of view. You know, right. on the housing density, yeah, it does help a little bit of a little more moderate, but once again, it increases the housing and I don't think it's like taxes. I don't, it's not the trickle down. I think there is some trickle down help, helping if more housing is built and moderate and so forth. So, and there's still low cost in there. It might not be as much, but it's still well, I think not that losing it. From my reading of the 1120, you know, the developers are like, we, this is too expensive for us to do this moderate and low income housing. We want a better deal. That's how that reads to me. When I read it, I was like, but their you know, deal is more units. Right. But they get more units. So they have more units that they can uh, uh, charge more uh, moderate uh, and not low income. Well, there's low income and moderate. And they get more. My point is that they get, they end up getting more moderate, moderate, and less. There's less low income. Uh, Lena has a question. These are all very good thoughts and questions that we um, unmute. Lana, go ahead. Okay, uh, this is where I feel that our committee has an opportunity to work with our outreach team and ask them to help us craft a message on social media uh, about these issues facing our um, neighbors and uh, you know, our, our living situations here. I believe that, that this might be a, a really nice opportunity uh, to communicate what, what is important um, that we are looking into these things and we're keeping our stakeholders informed. Right. That's, so, that's what uh, I'd just like to say. No, I appreciate that. This. And that's why I keep saying for everyone to really come out to the community plan meetings that I announce all the time to sign up for the newsletters um, and uh, participate in those community plan update meetings and let your voice be heard because these types of things tend to just kind of like come and then it happens and then everyone is just up in arms saying how come we didn't know about that well this is your opportunity these are the bills that are circulating around us and we need to get involved in any way possible be it outreach be it newsletters that go out um, our e-blasts that include the community plan meetings that uh, they're holding every three months uh, because they are already 
addressing some of these issues in the community plan updates that every community is working on. So we do need to participate in a way. And like you said, we have to find a council file. We have to write some letters. We do have to take a stance. Um, otherwise, I don't know what will happen. Um, but it might not be good and we might not be very happy about it. So uh, let's move on to uh, SB 899. Did you want to talk about that, Adele? Uh, 899 and AB 725, do you want to take those on? You're muted. You're muted. I'm sorry. I don't know how that's happening. Hang on. You have to unmute yourself. You have to go up to the I got yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, SB 899, I, I didn't write, I, I mean, I didn't write a, a synopsis. I just wrote my, uh, um, you know, my conclusions of it. Yeah. Basically, it would make uh, 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 building affordable housing for faith-based institutions and nonprofit colleges, mm. which would help them build safe, affordable housing for local residents and families and open doors to, uh, you know, sort of make their neighborhoods more high resource. Um, mm -hmm. The one nice thing about it is they will not be allowed to build on single family, um, any single family owned land that they own, um, but they will be able to build on their campuses directly. And, you know, like a, um, a church could have you know, some kind of a, a apartment building, you know, for whoever or in, and uh, nonprofit colleges could have housing for their students. So, right. Okay. That seems like a, I mean, you know, whatever. And then um, does anyone want to ask a question about that? Uh, I think I have a question from Englander the Rat. So oh, no. he has his hand up. Okay. Uh, Let's go ahead and see how I can unmute him. Why? You have to unmute yourself, Englander the Rat. Squeak. That's right, Englander the Rat. And then remember to join us, same federal court, July the 20th for United States versus Jose Wazar. Planning decisions. Now, we need a bill to cap the amount of payoffs on these projects. It costs too much to pay off these city council members and these planning directors and these building inspectors and these cops. I mean, it's taking up five to eight to 15% of the project that you have to spend on all these payoffs. We need state legislation to limit it to a fair amount of 1%. 1% maximum bribery per budget. I think that's a good start. And then finally, we need a bill. Whenever a city council member goes to Las Vegas and takes chips and gets caught stealing, life in prison without the possibility of parole, we need that. And then finally, why can only the institutions and nonprofits build? So if I take my house and I put it into a nonprofit, does that mean I get to build unlimited housing? Can what I speak to that, Mr. Englander? Why bother? It, why, Mr. Mr. Englander, Mr. Englander, it has nothing to do with what you're talking about. Uh, respectfully, he's allowed his, he's allowed his, uh, Mr. Wayne, Wayne Spindler's. These people in the city council and the city family are nothing but a bunch of thieves. That's why I have a 400 page affidavit from the FBI. Now I read it. Now you haven't read it. And we got to stop this goddamn stealing. That's the problem. It costs too much to bribe all these local bastards. That's why we're in the problem we're in. We're not building affordable housing. It's 600000 a unit for HHH because 200000 a unit goes to pay for Jose Weizar's prostitutes, chips. Your and time is expired. All right. Thank you, Randy. Uh, You're welcome. Adele, if you want to comment, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. I don't know why it keeps doing that. I, I don't know. 
So unfortunately, I changed, just so people know, I changed the rules in terms of mute, muting. So in order to make it that participants could not unmute themselves and speak at any time that they want, okay. it's a uniform rule across the board. So it allows the host controls when people um, can mute and unmute. That's why, and I, I, that, that's why I did it. So I apologize uh, for that. Uh, Adele, you are now got it. unmuted. And then last, I will say that for public comment. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, okay, so um, AB725, uh, yes. I wanted to look up who wrote it. It's a very strange bill. Um, uh, it's an ultra density bill that requires no affordable housing. I think, yeah, it was, it changes zoning to allow at least two units of housing, but no more than 35 units of housing per acre. So oh, this, wow. yeah, this bill encourages development of land zone now as single family to increase to multifamily parcels, including duplexes, fourplexes, garden apartment, townhomes in single family neighborhoods. This would be a moderate and above moderate housing uh, housing, and does not help with affordable or low income housing. Okay. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think I, when I, in my research, I think it was written by a very wealthy uh, uh, woman in um, San Francisco. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, this, for this to be the initial kickoff conversation that's around these bills, I think uh, we did really well in getting some information through um, to understand what is happening and circulating out there. So I appreciate all the input from everyone um, on these bills and we do need to stay on top of them. So uh, I will make sure that all of us are very well versed in them and that we do get um, as much um, pertinent information to our stakeholders um, so that they understand it as well. So um, next month, I'll put a plan together as to how we're gonna go ahead and approach these. And we just need to keep it in the forefront of our agenda and our minds month after month so that we don't let anything slip by. Um, and in my closing comments, uh, I just want to reiterate again, I will make sure that for the community plans that are up, that you do get that information and you do participate. Because even if it's just one sentence of a thought that you have, it could make an impact in a way that will benefit all of us and save our neighborhood in a way where we can all benefit. So um, does anyone else have anything to contribute? No, I would like to say, uh, I th think what you did was great, Lisa, assign different uh, bills to everybody to uh, make comments. I think it was helpful because I, you know, other than maybe Adele who read them all, <laughs> that's a lot of work and, uh, I, you know, I read them and still there was, it took a lot of time to decipher it. And uh, Adele and I might have a different point of view on uh, the trickle down in housing and how it might help, but it's good to get it all out there. And then also, I don't know whether this goes to Randy or whatever, but I'm sorry, I'm not sure I can take too much more of uh, the goat or the rat. And I don't understand why he can't be excluded. He can't because we're a public forum and he has the right to have his one minute to voice his comment and his opinion. Um, one um, minute, it feels a lot longer than one minute. Uh, well, you and know, if he's using foul language, isn't that uh, exempt? Then? So, I just to speak to that, and uh, here, let me just turn on my camera and for a second so you can see me i apologize and i'm walking while speaking we probably hope i don't give anyone vertigo anyway um and if you don't know me my name's randy uh and the new scnc president um 
So any member of the public is allowed to speak. And unfortunately, to a large extent, even if they are using expletives, um, it is Mr. Spindler's right to spend his time. Now, there are some limits, obviously, on free speech. Actually, he is an admitted member of the bar, so he knows um, what certain things he can and can't say. But he is allowed to speak. And because we're a public entity, and it does seem like he perhaps he speaks a lot, that's because he chooses to exercise his freedom of speech on every agenda item. Um, I have been in touch with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, uh, and they as well echo the same sentiment that I'm telling you now. The rules are he is allowed to speak. My suggestion is, and he, he obviously is still on and hears this, my suggestion is not to engage, not to inter interrupt him, uh, give him his minute, um, and then when his t the time, or for any speaker, by the way, I should say, when their time is expired, you say your time is expired, and you hit mute. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Go ahead, Lana. Um, I would just like to request that any of the public attending our meetings who have comments, please refrain from using language that would not be accepted, um, you know, at your dinner table with your grandparents, if you will. I, I find that the use of foul language is offensive and and not in in the most forward motion for our duty here. Um, I'm sure that there are other valuable pieces of information that can be shared in substitution of those words. Thank you. So aside from that, um, I often drive up and down Ventura Boulevard and in our neighborhood and uh, notice all that's going on. And I do take photographs and I do send them in to the appropriate departments to get them to clean up a mess or paint over graffiti or stripe a, a intersection. Um, for pedestrians. So I ask that you do uh, participate in that as well. This is your community too. I, I know I've dubbed this East End the forgotten end of Ventura Boulevard and I'm going to work very hard so that it isn't forgotten but it does tend to fall by the wayside a lot. So when you're out and about and Lana does this often, um, I encourage you to take photographs to either text it to me or email it to me and um, let's make sure that we stay on top of what's going on out there. It's, it's a lot and we have a lot to cover. So if we can take sections and um, I know some of you are up Carpenter, several of you are up Coldwater, uh, Laurel Canyon. Take a good chunk of your street and just keep an eye out and monitor the area and send me the information that you need help with. Um, I've said this before where Councilman Kokorian's office has hired a couple of gentlemen um, that they do send out to um, pay attention to certain areas uh, where weeds need to be pulled or trash cans need to be replaced because they're they're covered in graffiti and whatnot. Um, so let's 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 make sure that we work as a team in that area. And thank you for uh, saying what you did, Andrew. I'm trying every month. I, I try and see how we can all be involved and be inclusive of all that's going on in our community. Um, Englander the Rat apparently has one more thing to say before we wrap it up and I'm gonna let him go ahead and do that. And I am sorry for- right, I'm off, sorry. Okay. All right, no bye. worries. Bye, Andrew. Bye. Nice bye. seeing you, nice seeing you. Bye. I don't know where he is. Hang on. There he is. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, you don't like foul language. <laughs> you don't like unpopular speech. 
No, it's and not that. Follow? It's not appreciated. It's, it's, not, it's exactly. If you use foul language, it's not it's appreciated. It's very, very needed. Well, because okay. when I started screaming and yelling about okay. paying off building inspectors and everything else, that's okay. why finally the feds came in and took their big broom out on Tuesday, and they're going to take their broom out on some more of these fools down there. It's, right. The city is just rotted with corruption. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to sit here and talk about, oh, everything's so nice. No, everything's not nice. I was downtown with BLM tonight. Where were all you? Huh? Well, Where were all you? You guys... Talk nothing and you do nothing. You're just a bunch of phonies. You're all Trump We're supporters. Trying. You're all We're voting trying. for Donald Trump. That's what it is. So go ahead, Lana, say it. Trump 2020. Go ahead, Lisa. Trump 2020. Go ahead, guys. You all want Trump to win because you're all Wall Street investors. If you weren't, you would have been down tonight shouting down Jackie Lacey. Jackie Lacey, the criminal, letting killer cops off. That's where you guys would have been. But you don't want to come downtown, do you? No, okay. you don't want to come downtown. You want to stay in your right, little Wayne, houses with your Wayne, protected zoning. Minute, Wayne. You got your Thank protection. You. Your zoning. Wayne, your zoning I, is your protection. Um, all right. Uh, I move to adjourn. Thank you all so much. Again, Adele, welcome. You're going to be a huge asset to our committee. Um, and we really appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, thank you. All right, I adjourn the meeting. I move to motion. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.